my name is Jonina Irvin. I am the uh, acting chair of the Memphis Black Autonomy Federation um, in Memphis, Tennessee. I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I have been a community activist in the black community for quite a while, uh, since the early 70s. I was a member of the Black Panther Party um, for almost 10 years. And during that time, I was uh, editor of the Black Panther newspaper. I was actually the last editor of the Black Panther newspaper. I've been involved in a number of struggles in the black community around the country since the early 1970s. Um, it's been an important part of my life. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit uh, today about the problem of the mass imprisonment of black people uh, in the United States. Uh, a lot of times people in the United States like to talk about problems of incarceration in other parts of the world. But one thing a lot of people don't really focus on is the fact that on the one hand, the United States has 5% of the population of the world, just 5% of the population, but we have 25% of the prisoners in the world are in the United States. And you think about that, 5% of the world population, but 25% of, of all prisoners in the world are in the United States. No other country in the world has a higher prison rate, uh, rate of imprisonment than the United States does. And I think a lot of people don't think about that. They think about this as being the great land of the free and the home of the brave. But we do, in, 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 in fact, have that problem. Right now, almost half the people who are in prison in the United States um, are, in fact, black people. Uh, we make up about 13% of the U.S. population, uh, African Americans, but we make up uh, close to 50% of all the people who are in the prisons. So that is, that is why this is a particularly important issue for us. Uh, and we can connect this mass imprisonment of our people can be directed uh, um, to the problem of poverty. A lot of crimes that black people commit are economic crimes. They need money. They need money to pay their rent, to buy groceries, to buy uh, uh, clothes for their kids. Right now, we have one of the highest rates of black unemployment in the United States. People can't get jobs. Unfortunately, sometimes that may lead them to crime. We're not saying it's right that they should commit crimes, but people, if they have to eat, they'll do what they have to do. So our people wind up a lot of times getting arrested for economic crimes. And also, of course, the, the drug trade, the, the crackdown on the drug trade, or the, the overflow of drugs in the black community since the early 1980s uh, has also uh, been a, another contributor to the rise in the, of the rate of imprisonment of black people in the United States. Um, the saturation of drugs in the black community is another form of oppression for our people. Uh, so, because even if you could get a job, if you're strung out on drugs, you're not going to be able to keep one probably. So you look at the poverty, the high rate of poverty, unemployment, combined with the drug, uh, the flow of drugs in our community, that is what is causing this high rate of imprisonment of black people in the United States. And something that we don't talk about a, a lot, um, you know, we talk about the problems of drugs in the community because we've got to get the drugs off the streets. We've got to get to deal with the gang bangers. But we don't connect up to, uh, often enough the problems of poverty and unemployment with those uh, high figures of black incarceration. And unfortunately, in recent years, uh, the number of black women who uh, are imprisoned in the United States, that number has gone up. Uh, I read something on the internet too not long ago that said close to, I think it was 23, 24 percent of all the women incarcerated in prison in the United States are black women. So you look at that. What does it mean when we have all these people, black women and not to mention black men who are in prison at a much higher rate than the women are? We're talking about destruction of the black community. You've got people, potential mothers, fathers, husbands, wives whatever, they get locked up in prison, what happens to our families? It's devastating to our families. 
someone with some, some kind of a poll done about the fact that 75% of households in the of African American households in the United States are headed by single women, and it was criticizing black women for you know not having husbands and being married. Well, if you look at the high rate of incarceration of black men, imprisonment, there's a direct relationship. If black men are being locked up in prison, there aren't as many black men available for black women to marry. Not to mention the fact that among us sisters ourselves, we have a problem. So when we talk about mass imprisonment of our people, we have to look at it in terms of how it is impacting our whole community. It's devastating to black life and black culture in the United States. And, uh, and until we begin to look at it in that way, we begin to seriously deal with the problems of uh, poverty and unemployment. Uh, the situation um, is, is not, going to, not going to get any better. Um, Lorenzo, you uh, have had some experience, uh, unfortunately, more direct experience, a lot more direct experience with prisons than I have. Um, you know, what have you found to be true about this whole problem with mass imprisonment? Hello, uh, my name is Lorenzo Cambor Irvin. I'm the uh, coordinator of uh, the Memphis Black Autonomy Federation and one of the national spokespersons uh, of the organization. You know, I um, actually went to prison. Uh, in 1969, uh, when I was active in the civil rights movement with, you know, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, with uh, the Black pa Black Panther Party, which actually emerged from an alliance between the uh, civil rights, uh, the um, <coughs> SNCC, SNCC, and the uh, Black Panther Party, which was founded in 1966. And uh, I uh, was uh, driven out of my hometown, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, after years of activism there. And I had to leave the uh, country and go to Cuba for political asylum. And of course, uh, while I was on the run, the uh, government uh, was chasing me all over the world. And uh, eventually, I um, had left Cuba and gone to uh, Czechoslovakia and was trying to make my way to Africa and uh, was captured there by American authorities and then later brought back to the United States and given two life sentences <clears throat> uh, before an all-white jury in a small town in Georgia, a racist uh, town in Georgia called Noonan, Georgia. And, um, and after I was given this sentence and thrown into the prison system and everything, I was able to observe firsthand how the prison system and how the government of the United States actually uses imprisonment as a political tool uh, to not only um, you know, deal with political dissidents, but also specifically to how, to deal, how it deals with black people, how it started dealing with black people at the end of the, the, the black power period and how the government brought in drugs. Uh, we need to uh, point out that it was the federal government that created the drug trade in the United States, the modern day drug trade in terms of uh, heroin in, uh, in Harlem. The, the federal government and the mafia uh, created that. And the federal government at the end of the, uh, during and at the end of the uh, Vietnam War, or the war in Indochina, began to bring, dr uh, bring heroin from the so-called golden triangle countries of uh, uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and um, the third one erased, uh, escapes me. But uh, they were bringing these drugs in uh, for uh, mass distribution in primarily black communities. This was one of the first occasions, uh, or the second actual uh, major occasion where the federal government used chemical warfare in the black community to, uh, to try to destroy the militancy of that period. Uh, you know, the Black Panther Party had made substantial uh, inroads in terms of black mass consciousness and, and black organizing in the United States. And uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, head of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, had, had openly stated that the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States since its inception. So uh, they went all out in terms of COINTELPRO, and part of COINTELPRO, uh, the counterintelligence program, was not just to discredit uh, black leaders and organizations, as they did a great deal of that, even assassination, but to, but to try to destroy the material conditions in the black community that allowed a voice for black activists, a hearing, an ear for black activists. So what we're talking about is the kind of situation where it just laid the foundation. The ma uh, <clears throat> dealing drugs by the federal government and giving those drugs ultimately to drug dealers in the, in the, in the um, cities themselves, and then the rise of um, the later uh, rise of um, uh, crack cocaine as a tool, 
These things allowed the federal government, the, the, especially the crack cocaine trade, allowed the federal government to create a paramilitary state. Uh, to turn the police from a so-called civil police force that dealt with civilian uh, policing issues to go from that to becoming to, to receiving military armaments from the Pentagon and then becoming a uh, police state, a police state. That's what we, we're entering into at that stage, what we're talking about. And, of course, that brings us up to now. So that uh, they were able to use uh, paramilitary policing as a, as a key method of dealing with uh, the drug trade. And they were kicking in people's doors and shooting and killing people. And you've got that continuing to happen. You have a large number of, of cases of police uh, homicides. And most of those police homicides are related to, to the drug trade in one form or another. And they've also uh, been able to create this uh, continuation of this political counterinsurgency to try to prevent any kind of black uh, revolutionary tendency from, from erupting or coming in, into existence as a legitimate threat once again to the American government. And so um, with all of those things working together and with mass, with mass arrests in drug trade, in drug uh, cases I should say, then you have had millions of people go to prison uh, and you've had, you've had uh, the destruction of thousands of black communities. Now one of the things to bear in mind is that in the 1960s, or with the drug trade, you know, with heroin and all of this, it did not have 100% penetration in small towns and in, in, in large cities all over the country. There were some cities uh, that didn't have hardly any uh, hard drugs at all. Uh, but when when um, the, the distribution of crack cocaine came into existence and the federal government itself was involved with that, the Reagan administration was involved with that, you know, both the CIA as well as the Pentagon and other elements of the Reagan administration were involved with the drug trade. When all of that uh, went into uh, really making a decisive push into the black community and using the black community as a tool a, 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 uh, for one, selling drugs and making a mass amount of money and make one of the largest uh, revenues of, of money in the world comes from the drug trade and that has gone into the coffers of not only illegal organizations but it has also gone into the profits of the of the uh, of illegitimate bankers in the United States that have secreted these funds and have gone into the so-called black budget of the United States government that is the 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 budget that uh, finances uh, government terrorism that finances so-called uh, covert operations all over the world that money comes from the drug trade and that money is what is used to destroy our communities every day. This government is responsible for the conditions in our community, the drug trade. All, everything that we see right now happening, and it has been happening for the last 50 years, that has been a direct response of the United States government being involved in the drug trade and being involved in counterinsurgency, using the drug trade as a form of counterinsurgency. So this government, these people, are responsible for these crimes that's happening right now. We're so ignorant, we don't know anything. We think it's just some brother on the corner doing it. Some brother on the corner selling drugs and that's what's destroying our community. We don't understand that we have a legitimate white supremacy a leadership that's trying to destroy our community, that's using advanced methods to do it. And then the, on the one hand, they're pushing drugs. On the other hand, they're creating a kind of police state terrorism that allows the police to then come in and kick in doors. So they're playing what they used to call it Two ends against the middle. We're the middle. They're playing against us. We're being crushed, you know, uh, by on the one hand, the paramilitary policing. On the other hand, we're being crushed by the government pushing drugs. The government created crack cocaine. And the government actually gave crack cocaine to drug dealers on the West Coast to get it financed and to get it started. So this government, and by cre the creation of that, you know what that is? That is genocide. And you hear people talking about genocide all the time, and it's just rhetoric. I'm telling you, this is uh, legally understood to be genocide. And this should have long ago been taken to the United Nations. Long ago, Malcolm X talked about, uh, if you want justice, don't look to get it in the American courts. Go to the world court. And this is something that should have long ago been taken to the world court. This genocide in the United States. And, and, and you know then that we don't have leadership. We don't have an honest black leadership here because what's happening, they are afraid 
to pr to take it outside of America and to talk about, as Brother Malcolm said, uh, human rights as opposed to just civil rights, uh, which is a domestic form of, of issue, a legal issue to be dealt with in the United States. And it ain't never dealt with because the United States government is the one pushing the drugs. And, they, and they're punishing us for it. They're punishing our young people for it. You know, so they created the international and the national drug trade. They pushed it. And the, these same people who pushed it are, are allowed to walk the streets and, and live with their families while our, our young people are, are put in concentration camps. They're put in concentration camps. So there we come to the question of and the issue of the rise of the prisons as a form of genocide in the United States. When I went to prison, uh, it was like 60 to 70 percent white and, you know, 25 to 30 percent black in those days in the federal prisons and pretty much to a similar degree in even the state prisons at the time. Well, 25 years later, with the rise of the drug trade, with drug pushing by the government, it, those figures were turned around on their head. And to, to now you're talking about 75 to 80 percent of the prisoners in the uh, federal and state prison systems being blacks or people of color. There's about one million uh, black prisoners in the United States, and there's a similar number, somewhere between 750 to one million Latinos that are in the prison system at this particular time, and there's a small number of whites. So we're talking about them totally transforming the prison system. And we need to understand this because if you don't understand the origins of something, if you don't understand how something is created, you can never defeat it. You can never defeat it. And it's extremely important that we understand that we are living and dealing with a, a situation where the government is responsible. The government has created genocide, racial genocide, and they continue to hold us in prison as a form of that genocide, as a continuation of it. So they've destroyed our communities. They've destroyed communities that were vibrant. Uh, some of them were middle class, and some of them were, were communities where people you know, had hope and, and, and ambitions and so forth. They were destroyed with crack cocaine as a form of chemical warfare by the government, giving drugs to drug dealers at free or low cost so that they could start their trade and destroy our community. So we have to take these criminals, these criminals, we can't take them in American courts. That's been proven already. When the stuff came out about the CIA pushing drugs, the, the so-called cocaine import agency, when all of that came out, when all the stuff came out about the Reagan administration, they were able to stifle it in the American court and make this, this white dope dealer, uh, this guy Oliver North, to make that white dope dealer into some kind of national hero. He's a hero all of a sudden. But he's a drug dealer. He's a bigger. He's a big drug dealer than any of us have seen on our streets in America. So we're so ignorant. Oh, who these? We we'll get the police to lock all these people up. It won't change a thing. It won't change a thing. You will never get stability in the black community. You'll never get financial resources in the black community. For the simple fact that these people are have us under attack. You know, one in is again the police and paramilitary policing, and the other end is government-sponsored drug trade. Get that in mind, get that under your consciousness, get that under your skull so you can, can deal with that. Because unless you deal with that, you will never, ever, ever be able to solve anything in the community. You'll never be able to. And so what we're talking about is um, a way of fighting this. And all this stuff with the drugs, the so-called gangs, and, and all this stuff that they, they're always talking about, the, the so-called drug gangs. The American government and the American society created drug gangs. They created this social problem. They want this social problem because it destabilizes our community. So we created a movement. We're creating a movement with black autonomy uh, called the Black Autonomy Prison Federation. And the Black Autonomy Feder Prison Federation is taking the advice of prisoners who've been reading my book, for instance, uh, Anarchism and the Black Revolution for a long time inside the prisons. and they have this, they have come to you know come to some consciousness and conclusions some conclusions about what needs to be done so we're li we're really listening to them 
The prisoners are the, are the leadership in this. And uh, so we're trying, to, we're at the early stages of creating this Black Autonomy Prison Federation. And the Black Autonomy Fed Prison Federation has specific goals to deal with, you know, the problems of, in, in the community in terms of gang banging, the problems in dealing with the black community in terms of the drug trade used against us. You know, we understand that the government is behind the drug trade and it's the government that has to be held responsible. It's the government that has to be charged with, with genocide. And so we're trying to, to, to realize all these prisoners are a resource. You know, these are the real dragons uh, that will uh, take our struggle to a higher level because they'll, they'll come out of prison with a higher level of consciousness and commitment. This is what we're trying to, to build. We're trying to reach those prisoners, trying to reach them and give them revolutionary consciousness, not to vote their self free or some other nonsense like that. That's not ever going to happen. We're never going to vote ourselves free. You got these so-called black nationalist politicians running around here talking this nonsense about vote for me and I'll set you free. You ain't never going to be set free by no politician. I don't care what he calls himself. It's just not going to happen. It's illogical. It does not. If you look at the governments all over the world, you look at people all over the world right now, they're fighting their governments. They're not running or joining the government. They're fighting the government. They're trying to remove the government. And they're trying to build, you know, self-empowerment and, and self-government. And this is what we need to be doing. We need to be trying to build dual power in this country. <coughs> I'm sorry until we can get revolution, dual power. Dual power means that while the government still exists, we will begin to accumulate power at the community-based level so that we can then talk about confronting these people on a, on a level that we can wipe them out. Stuck in America, now what? and you subject the police terror. Now how come? You bite your tongue to tolerate that game with badges and blues, but you bang on each other for brother step on your shoes. Open fire.